Welcome to the prayer room on the Daily Fire. This is prayer room 24. Breakthrough in finances. We serve the God who breaks through. He is the God whose name is Breakthrough. 2 Samuel 5.20 shows that David called the Lord. The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. God breaks through like a burst of water. Think of a dam breaking and water flowing powerfully through it. That is the God that we serve. He's the God that breaks through barriers. Micah 2.13 says, He who breaks through has gone up before them. They will break through and pass the gate and go out by it. Then their king will pass on before them, the Lord at their head. He not only breaks through for us in our circumstances in life, but he also goes before us. He leads and he walks ahead of us in life. And we just follow after him and he does what only he can do and bring breakthrough where we need it. Today we're going to be specifically praying and declaring around the topic of financial breakthrough in our lives. Lord, I just lift up your name and I lift up your holiness, your righteousness. You are worthy of all of our praise and attention and adoration. And I just honor you. You are the creator of all things. You are God almighty and everything is for you and through you and to you. And you made everything and therefore you own everything everything there is no situation too difficult for you to overcome and there is no financial scenario that you cannot resurrect in the mighty name of Jesus Christ so much authority is captured and held in that name Yeshua HaMashiach the name of our Lord all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him with that name and we as his children have been seated with him in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father and chosen as the vessels of his authority on this earth as it was in the original design of Adam and Eve the authority to rule and reign on the earth was restored through the sacrifice and reconciliation work of Jesus Christ therefore now We can resume our place at his right hand with our Father in heaven, giving us our full inheritance of abundant life here on earth. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. There is no lack in his kingdom. God, we just honor you right now and come into agreement with the reality that there is nothing lacking in you. There is nothing lacking in you at all and in your kingdom, there is nothing but abundance. You are a God of abundance. You come to give us abundant life because you are the one who actually holds life in his hands. You're the only one that has real life to give. And it is 
unlimited life that flows towards us in Christ Jesus. You have abundant life within you to release to your people. And as your children, we inherit that from you. Psalm 34:10 says, the young lions are in want and suffer hunger, but the ones who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Take us, God, from a mindset of scarcity into a mindset of abundance. Give us the ability to truly wrap our minds around who our Father is, who owns everything. There is nothing that you lack, Lord. And as our, your children, we don't lack either. But we are so easily deceived and manipulated by our circumstances and voices other than yours to believe that we are in a situation of lack. Jesus, you demonstrated it so poignantly when you multiplied food on this earth before your people, your disciples and all of those who were following you watched you physically multiply, breaking the laws of mathematics and physics and all of the other things that are earthly measurements you broke all of those things and multiplied before their eyes what appeared to be limited was actually unlimited there are no limitations for you and you long to lavish us with beautiful good gifts in fact, Proverbs 22, 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord, that is where riches and honor and life actually come from. O oh Lord, this day make us humble before you and fear you and you alone. Not just so that we can receive the blessings that come with that, the riches, the honor, the life that you promise, in your word that will come with that, but God, to put our hearts in right alignment before you. You give us so many words of wisdom throughout your word about how to handle material possessions, riches, um, clothing, food, shelter, all of those things that you say that we don't need to worry about those things. But if we seek you first in your righteousness, that you will give all of these things to us freely. And as a good father, you know how to give good gifts to your children. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. According to his riches, how great are his riches? They're unlimited riches in his glory. And he will supply every need. He can supply many times over what our needs are. He is not limited. Oh God, open our minds to really, really, really get this. That you are not limited and you just desire to lavish things on us. There are certain pathways in your word that you lay out for us to follow. And if we can just trust you and let go of control and follow those things, Lord, we will receive our breakthroughs. We will receive our breakthroughs. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. There is so much blessing waiting once those windows of heaven are opened up that we would not even have enough room to receive it. But it first requires us to 
trust you, let go of control, and offer you the full tithe. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine. Honoring the Lord with our first fruits. Show us, God, what that looks like in each one of our lives individually. Show us how to obey you and honor your structure and pattern laid out in scripture. Show us how to honor those things that we may receive the blessings. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. These are patterns and structures that you have put in place, Lord. This is the way the world works as you have created it to work. Give your people an ability to wrap their minds around it, embrace your ways, not their own ways, and surrender and trust in you at a whole new level. Proverbs 11, 24 to 25, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That is a promise. Give freely and become more wealthy. Refresh others and you will be refreshed. We receive that now in Jesus' name and come into agreement with that truth over our life right now in Jesus' name from that position of abundance over scarcity. The only reason for greed and stinginess is a scarcity mindset where we think that there's not enough to go around. Break off that mindset from us and our families in Jesus' mighty name. Replace that with a mindset of abundance that we can embrace your ways, God, as being superior to our own ways. Give us the fruit of self-control in our lives that we can put all these things into place. Without that, we have no ability to obey you. And from this place of obedience, God, we cry out for strategies, divine strategies of prosperity and sustenance, even in the midst of famine, just like you gave your servant Joseph. You caused him to prosper an entire nation in the middle of a famine because of your divine strategy. You blessed him because he was obedient and he feared you, Lord and honored you above all else. Matthew 16, 19 says, God, that you have given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven and Whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You've given that authority to us, Lord, your people. And with that authority, we will choose to move forward believing you and what you say in your word about our finances and whatever financial hurdles we may be facing, we will bind up those struggles and we will loose 
prosperity and we will lose divine strategy we will lose obedience to your word and the fear of you and trust in you in our lives we have keys right now and we will learn our authority as you place us within our calling in this life and we will open doors that could not have been opened without us having our relationship with you, Lord. So much so that it will cause people around us to wonder how we got where we are. And they will marvel at what God, you alone have done for us. And they will know it was you and it wasn't us. God, I ask you to give me your keys to the kingdom. Jesus promised the disciples, give me those keys. In fact, they already are ours. They are already mine. I know they are. Help me to access them. I want to open new doors in my family, my life, and the industry that I'm in that have never been opened before or that are not open to me at the moment. I pray that you would give me the keys to heaven's economy and to resources that will bring about everything I need to fulfill my calling and destiny. I pray that my family and I would access the full provision you have already uh, prepared for our calling and purposes that you created for us. I pray that you would use me to also shut doors to sin and to the enemy in my spheres of influence in this world. I also pray you would use my life to shut the door to any activity by the enemy in the sphere I am called to. As I use the authority you have given me to open up your doors and release your economy, I pray that I will have opportunities I could not have produced without you. I pray that my life will not be limited to what I can build alone with my own efforts, but that because of my relationship with you, I will receive kingdom opportunities that only come out of my partnership with you. Jesus, will you help me to live in the economy and provision you paid for on the cross and provided through the power of your resurrection? Will you help me to be a recession proof with my finances and what I am building, that no matter what comes in the economy and the world around me, I will not be shaken because I am built on a firm foundation in you. I now surrender everything regarding my resources and finances, and I ask you to speak to me about it all so I can succeed in bringing your dream into this world. Amen. Let's declare. I declare that God has given me his kingdom keys to finance and resource. I declare that I am not limited to the natural economy, but I am participating with heaven's economy where there are more than enough opportunities, finances, resources, relationships, ideas, and creativity. I recognize that God has already broken through in the area of my resources and finances that he has promised me through John 1010 10 resources to live the fullness of his life and that the, these resources are spiritual, relational, and also natural. I am committed to partnering with God as the source of all my opportunities, provision, resources, businesses, relational capital, investments, real estate, and anything he provides for me. I declare breakthrough of resources and heaven's economy over my life and my family, my occupation and workplace, my industry, my street, my neighborhood, and my city. I pray that God would provide everything needed to bring about his full plan. I ask for ideas, creativity, favor, and opportunities 
to create heaven's economy on earth, I pray that God would unlock in me a sense of ownership over his vision for this world. And that as I partner with him, breakthrough will happen in my vision for resources. Meaning, as I surrender to the Lord and desire to come in alignment with his plans and his ideas and partner with him that my mind set will be completely renewed and changed as it pertains to resources. I declare that everything I need to see my destiny and him fulfilled has already been provided by the finished work of the cross and I declare that it is unlocked to me now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning and welcome everybody to the Daily Fire. This is Margo. I am so glad to have you with me this morning live or later on the replay. I pray that you are blessed and encouraged by our prayer time this week. Uh, this week we're praying as you heard if you were with us just a few minutes ago about breakthrough in finances. We've been doing a series of prayer videos together the last several weeks all around different areas of breakthrough in our lives. And this week is the week we're praying specifically about breakthrough in finances. It is a powerful, powerful video. So if you weren't here Monday for prayer time, I hope you were here this morning. If not, you can catch it again on Thursday. And I'm just believing the Lord to begin to shift mindsets and to shift perspectives and his people and bring financial breakthrough in such a way that it blesses the world around us and not just pays our bills, but it, it furthers the kingdom on earth. And that is the goal, right? That is the goal. So with that, um, let's see who's with us in the chat this morning. I saw Karen on here first thing this morning. Good morning, Karen. Jen P is here with us this morning. Good morning, friend. Tony's with us this morning. Good morning, friend. Miss Gail is here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hermance. Good morning. And oh, that's JP again. <laughs> Amy, good morning. So good to see all of you lovely ladies on here this morning. Um, this is our final week of the life of Joseph. I mean, Jacob. I keep, and I have literally confused their names the entire time we've been doing this. Um, so, but life of Jacob. We have started this, but it's been about four months, four months. This is definitely the longest session we've ever had, um, but it has been quite a journey. And for those that have been here, I mean, there's some of you that have literally been here every single day for the last four months with me. And I just thank you for being with me on this. And um, wow. So we've just got today and Thursday, and then that wraps it up and the daily fire will take a break. Um, and, but, and I'll be communicating with you guys and letting you know what we're coming back with. Um, those of you who have been in my book club this session, you know, I've already got ideas for the next book club we're going to do in the summer. Um, and so we're not stopping, but we will be taking a break and I'll be, you know, spending some time with the Lord, really seeking the Lord on what he wants to do next with the daily fire. Um, this ministry has been such a blessing to me and hopefully to you too. And I know God has plans for it. So I just need to press in and spend some time and let him tell me what he wants to do next. Cause that's what we always do for anybody who's new around here. This is what we always do here on the daily fire. This is my spiel. You will find we're a group of people that live like God is really real. The Bible is really his word and it's true. And as we read it together and we allow Holy Spirit to do his job, which is to lead us into all truth, our faith just becomes ignited 
right? Together. We get on fire for the Lord together in all new ways. Well, that the way that we do it is I just ask him what he wants us to read. And then that's what we read the next the next several weeks. And however long it takes to get through that material, that's how long we go. So that's what we've been doing with the life of Jacob um, is reading through until it's done. It's not a sermon series. It I know it kind of seems like it might be with you when you just look at the pictures that say, oh, the life of Jacob. It's not a sermon series. It's not something that Margot plans out. It is what the Lord said to do. And we just start doing it. And I don't even really read ahead of you guys um, other than skimming through it one time the evening before. I don't go ahead and plan lessons, so to speak. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that. That's just not the format of this particular ministry. It is very much a spirit led read through the Bible. And I love to just give him full reign on here to do whatever he wants to do. So with that in mind, let's go into prayer now and invite the Holy Spirit to take control of this broadcast this morning and say and do what he wants, because that's all we really need. Okay. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here, that you are always, always with us. You're inside of us. You are outside of us, all over us. You're just everywhere around us and in us. And I, I pray right now that every person listening to my voice would become aware of you right now in this moment. Let your presence be known to them. Let them become aware physically of your presence with them and inside of them right now. Thank you, Lord. I think there are some this morning that just needed to be reminded that he has not left you and he's with you. Powerfully. Powerfully. Tangibly. You can feel and sense his presence with your five senses. Lord, I thank you that you just want to make yourself known this morning. And we just want you to take over and we want you to read this word to us today. There's so much in today's chapter. Show us what you want us to focus on and what you want to draw out of it for us today. Speak to hearts and to minds this morning and get Margot out of the way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So this is what happens when you do let the spirit lead. Sometimes you think you're going to pray one thing and then you start praying a whole nother thing and that's okay. <laughs> so that was, that is how I let, let the Holy Spirit lead you guys. That's how it goes, right? Amen, Hermance. Amen, Tony. That's right. Praise God. He's so gracious. He loves us so much. He wants to stop and say, hey, there's some of, some of my people don't even feel my presence right now. Oh, oh. Well, we need to let, make sure they do 100%. Okay. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. All right. We're going to go into Genesis 49. Are you ready for this? Something in my little heart just loves the fact that Genesis is exactly 50 books. And I don't know why that makes me so happy. It's just such a nice round number. So today, 40, chapter 49. Thursday, chapter 50, and we're just going to let the Lord speak to us. Now, we're at the very end of Jacob's life, as you can imagine. We started his life out in January. We're ending it here in April. And there is so much packed into this one chapter. What we see is a man on his deathbed. Literally, he's in his bed when this is all happening. Um bestowing a blessing upon each of his sons. If you were here with me on Thursday, you know that he, in the last chapter, blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two sons. And because of who Joseph is and everything that had transpired with his sons, he literally took the status of the first and second born out of his own line, Reuben and Simeon, took that that honor from them and bestowed it upon Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons. 
Because essentially what he's doing with that is he's making Joseph, Joseph's line, get the blessing of the firstborn. Now, Joseph was a firstborn of his mother. He was not Jacob's firstborn son, but he was his firstborn son with Rachel, right? So everything has, but everything that has transpired has led him to revoke that firstborn status away from Reuben and bestow it upon Joseph and specifically more so upon Ephraim, who is actually the second born of Joseph. So that was a fascinating, fascinating read. Go back and watch Thursday's video if you want more info on that, because it is such a prophetic picture. Oh my goodness. When you consider the fact that um, Jacob himself was the second born who ended up getting the blessing of the firstborn. And then now he's bestowing that upon Ephraim. And then it's a picture of Christ and it's the second Adam. And blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's a whole cool thing that the Lord is doing with that. But suffice to say, all of the boys are in the room together right now as this is happening. He's on his bed. He's blessed. He's already blessed Joseph and his sons. Well, he hasn't blessed Joseph yet. He's blessed the sons. Okay. Now he's going to turn to the others. And, and everything that he is about to say to them is a blessing, but it also is a prophecy over not just them as individuals, not just their families, the future of their um, tribes, because these men will become the 12 tribes of Israel from this point forward. Basically, they grow into tribes. There's still one clan at this point in history, but they're about to start, you know, Jacob's going to pass away and they're about to start growing into the 12 tribes. <laughs> Tony said, shout out to the second born. Shout out. Are you a second born, Tony? Because I'm a first born. So I don't know how I'm going to get get on board with that. So much. <laughs> um. Anyway, so so. So that these these words in this chapter are not just words, okay? These are very important words. These are prophecies. The blessing of the father was actually a thing. Like it wasn't just nice words. It's especially in Western culture, we just think things like that. Oh, let's just speak a blessing. Let's bless the food. And it's just nice words. Like, oh, that's that's nice. That's sweet. Let's do that. That's not at all equivalent to what is happening here in this word. The father's blessing was like a tangible thing. People had fought each other over it in his lifetime. He had fought his brother over this at 40 years old. Do you remember that? This is like a tangible thing with power and in, it will influence your life. And they all know it. And so watch the specific things that he says. Now, because there's 12 of them, there's a lot to go through in this. We're not going to be able to dive deeply into every single one of the tribes and how that father's blessing was a prophetic picture or not just a picture. It was a prophecy and it was fulfilled in the life of that son and or the tribe that came out of them. Usually both. Most of these prophecies, it will show you will see it play out in the life of that man. And then later down through history, the life of the tribe that he was the head of. Tony said, yes, you are. I get a little second born. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Of course, you're shouting out. Um, OK, so we don't have time, is my point, to dive deeply in and follow through each one of these men and what God has said. So I am trusting right now that as we just begin to read, Holy Spirit's going to highlight which ones he wants to talk about. Okay. And if so, if we skip over or we just kind of gloss over some of them, that is why I'm going to go. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to prompt me on what he wants to hang out on and what he wants to not hang out on for today. All right. So let's go into it. Um, Genesis 49 verse 1. And Jacob called his sons and said, 
gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. So he is not even mincing words about this. He's like, come, 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 come. I'm about to prophesy and it's going to happen to you. Whoa. I want you to put yourself in their shoes. They're like, oh, it's time. It's time. And they're all gathering around and they're like, oh, he's about to do it. He's about to do it. He's about to do it. They know whatever comes out of his mouth has power. It has power. And they're about to receive their destiny. Essentially, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. He said, I'm about to tell you what's about to happen to all of y'all. Whoa. Let's go sit and listen. Let's go sit and listen. In fact, oh. Have you noticed how many prophecies have come out of this family? All the way back to Abraham, the prophetic. None of them are called prophets. We don't call him prophet Jacob. We don't call him prophet Abraham or prophet Isaac or any of those things, but they all prophesy. They all prophesy accurately. Verse two, gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn. Oh, I feel like I need to go back. Okay, verse two again. Why does he say it this way? Listen, gather together and hear you sons of Jacob. So he's identifying as their father. He said, you're my sons. I'm your dad. Come listen to me. And he includes, he and listen to Israel, your father. Why in the world did he name himself twice and give them the instructions twice? That tells you what he's about to say concerns them as his sons directly, as their one-on-one -on -one relationships go, and it concerns the nation of Israel that is to come. That's why he does that. So that's how we know for sure these prophecies are about to extend way beyond just the individual. All right. And he knows it too. And he's, he, pre he preps them for it. He's like, here we go. It's about to happen. This is going to be about you. And it's going to be about your generations to come. Verse three, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water. Wow, that was blunt. He So he starts out by you know, affirming him as all of these things. And he's like, Th these were the things that you were to be. This is as my firstborn, you were supposed to be all of these, this dignity and this power and the strength. But guess what? You're unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Dang, poor Reuben. Now you can see that his decision, whether it was his own decision or the Lord told him to do this, it doesn't make it clear. To take away that firstborn right from Reuben and pass it on to Joseph's sons, it didn't have just to do with the fact of how awesome Joseph was. It also had to do with the fact of Reuben you are reaping what you have sown. You dishonored me. And we all read that story, if you were here with us, where Reuben went up and laid with his father's concubine. You can't just go and sleep with your stepmom or whatever they were. They were like sister wives, so I don't even know. But you can't just go take your father's wife and defile him. That's what the couch is, defiling his couch. That's like my bed. You got in bed with my wife. So sorry. Bye. You were awesome, though, until that. Could you imagine being Reuben in this situation? How horrible. My gosh, how horrible. He does try to make up for it, though. He, Reuben did. You can tell he had a change of heart throughout the story. But still, he's going to have to reap some of that. Um, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. 
Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger, they slew a man and in their self will, they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger. For it is fierce and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Just a quick refresher. Why? What happened? Do you remember the story of when Dinah was uh, defiled? Remember, they were at Shechem, which was a very, very evil place. And honestly, Jacob should not have stopped there to begin with. We all read that story together. But and because he stopped and he hung out in this evil place, his daughter went to look for friends in this town. She wanted to hang out with other ladies because all she had was brothers. And the men of the town raped her. And her brothers, Simeon and Levi, got really angry and literally murdered the entire town. You guys remember that? That is one of the craziest stories in the Bible, in my opinion. And there's so many wild stories in the Bible, but that is one of the craziest ones. They came up with this scheme to to deceive all of the men of that town into um, circumcising themselves first. Deceived them into doing that genital mutilation upon themselves as full grown men first. And then on the third day, I think it was when they knew because these guys know circumcision. They knew that's when it hurts the worst and you're basically incapacitated. Then that they waited till that day while these men were all in pain and could not move because their manhood had been destroyed. And they went in and murdered all of them. So that was a pretty like. You can understand why the men, why they were so upset that their sister had been abused like that. But at the same time, like the level of evil rage that came out of those boys they um, murdered an entire town of men. So, and then they plundered the whole place and took all their good. I mean, it was bad. So he's basically saying, listen, I can't bless that. I can't get in. When, when, when Jacob says, um, let not my honor be united to their assembly. He's like basically disowning those, their actions. He doesn't want his good name to be tarnished by that crazy, murderous, barbaric behavior of his sons. Um, and so now we know Levi, the Lord, some of what is said here definitely plays out, okay, over history. We can't go into every detail, but the Lord also is such a grace-filled redeemer God. And that is true in the Old Testament as much as it is today. People often go like, oh, Old Testament God, he was mad and angry, right? And then New Testament God, now he's happy because Jesus? <laughs> no, 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 no. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as you study, if you go into a deeper dive of each of these um, tribes and how this their actions, how they do reap what they sow, is what I'm trying to say, and these prophecies do fulfill However, because of the grace of our God, he does allow them to be redeemed in a lot of ways as well, because God is that's who he is. It, so we know that, for example, Levi, I was going to point out, becomes the tribe of priests. He becomes the tribe of priests. One of the things, though, about that is they did not get an allotment of their own land in the promised land. Have you ever wondered, those of you who have studied that out and, and love the story of um, Joshua and le leading them into the promised land and handing out the land allotments, have you ever wondered why did it, Levi, but they're like the priests, right? Shouldn't they get the best of the best? Nope. They get to share in a percentage of everyone else's allotment, but God alone is their inheritance, which is beautiful and enough in and of itself. But it could be said that this is part of why. And I believe Simeon also, if I'm not misspeaking, did not get their own allotment of land. Um, 
I will have to look at that. But some of that plays out once they finally, these tribes finally make it to the promised land hundreds of years later, talking like 400 years later, probably roundabout. Okay. Um, and you will see this reaping and sowing happen, but yet, and still the Levites were honored priests. Okay. So you can see we do reap what we sow, right? But God also redeems it in so many ways. I see my hubby's on here in the chat. I'm not ignoring you. Um, Reuben saved Joseph's life also. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. And I believe, um, I believe he was trying to make up for his wrongs, to be honest with you, because he, he tried, he tried to do right by Joseph the whole time when the brothers hated him and all throughout the, you know, he was definitely against what happened to Joseph the whole time. And then he tried to help out uh, when he didn't know it was Joseph in Egypt. He tried to help out and was very selfless in that whole thing too. And, um, but he's still reaping what he sowed to a degree, to a degree he is. Now catch this next one. Okay. Lord help me as I go into this one. I want everybody's full attention on this next one. We're going into Judah. We're going into Judah. Judah is very important. Verse eight. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Remember Judah's name means praise. When way back when he was first having all these kids, we went through their names and what they mean. The meaning of these names, right? And the meaning of the name of Judah is praise. And remember, as Leah was having all these boys, she named them based on kind of what her own experience in life was and her own emotional state at the time. Which was kind of sad for some of them that carried like bad names. But Judah got like the best name, right? It means praise. Um. Well, listen to this. He He's saying his brothers shall praise him. What could that mean? Why would his brothers praise him? Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. There it is again. Who are his father's children? His brothers. He's saying it again in another way. His brothers shall down, bow down to him. Catch this, you guys. I hope you're seeing it before I say it. I hope you're seeing it. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, for nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. In he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Oh my goodness. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Now, oh goodness. Judah gets a whole one, two, three, four, five verses. Judah gets a whole five verses. Why do you think that is? Oh, it was a beautiful poetic thing. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Who is Judah? Judah becomes Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy over Jesus Christ. He is from the tribe of Judah. And Jacob himself thousands of years, centuries before Jesus Christ ever came, is seeing the Messiah come through the line of Judah. 
here on his deathbed. Oh, I'm getting the chills, you guys. It's an, it's amazing. I mean, you. this is the kind of the things when it's like people that don't believe, right? The people or people that are like the Bible. Oh, pff, who believes the Bible is true? Who believes that old book? Explain to me how this man centuries before it happened knew that Jesus Christ was going to come through the line of Judah. Tell me. If that's not supernatural, how do I know he's talking about Jesus? Well, why, Judah, your, your brothers are going to praise you. Well, he wasn't talking about the man Judah himself. He was talking about the tribe of Judah. And he says it twice. Your father's children will bow down before you. What happens to the tribe of Judah? They ultimately become the tribe of kings. King David himself was from the tribe of Judah and his son Solomon. And remember Solomon, it was a family lineage of kings. That's why it says um, the scepter in verse 10, the scepter, that is an a image or a picture of power and kingship and rulership. That scepter shall not depart from the tribe of Judah. So it becomes a prophecy over the nation of Israel and the tribe of Judah being a kingly tribe, but it also includes Christ Jesus. And we know this because he bows down as a lion. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus Christ himself. When it talks about in verse 10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. So a lawgiver between his feet, that's talking about, again, someone with power, a, a rulership, until Shiloh comes. Who is Shiloh? That is speaking about the Christ, the Messiah. And they knew what that would have meant. Shiloh. It's It's a... Reference to the coming Messiah. Guys, this, I want you to put yourself in the frame of mind for really appreciating. Do you know how far away this is from historically, from everything? Like you've had Noah at this point. He was a man of great faith, right? You've had um, Abraham. You've had Isaac. You've had Jacob now. You have not had Moses yet. That's another Centuries away, before, before, centuries before Moses, before the law was given. These people were prophesying the Messiah since the beginning, the very beginning. Okay, that's what I want you to grasp here. Um, and to him shall, so until, so what he's saying is the, the tribe of Judah is going to have rulership. That scepter of power, the lawgiver coming from them until Shiloh comes. So until the Messiah comes. All right. And to him, he capitalizes this word. This capital to him, but the meaning the Messiah shall be the obedience of the people. Binding his donkey to the vine. Now. This, this, I feel like is where the Holy Spirit wants to hang out this morning for sure. Of course, because he's always, Holy Spirit is here to glorify Jesus Christ all the time. He loves to glorify Jesus Christ. And so that's why when I'm reading through this, I'm getting those chills. I'm like, oh, I know the Spirit loves this so much. He loves to glorify Christ. He loves to. So he wants us to hang out on this and, oh, lift up the name of Jesus with him. So. Gosh, there's so much in this. It's just crazy. Like, I really hope that y'all are as amazed as I am right now. The donkey. Let's talk about what this symbolism means. Okay. it It's talking about um, fruitfulness, basically. So your donkey tied to the choice vine. Okay. It's like you have the best of the best. 
your donkey isn't just tied up behind a shack out there in your backyard. No, you're, you, you will even take your vines are so plentiful and so amazing that you'll even tie a donkey to one of them. Cause it ain't no thing to you. That's what that means. You're not, you're not concerned. It's like, you'll take and you'll tie your donkey to your Rolls Royce because it ain't no thing to you because you have five of them. Does that make sense? Um, and then he washed his garments in wine. This is another symbol of fruitfulness, riches, wealth of the land. If you had a lot of wine, so much so that you could wash your garments in it, then you had a lot. You were very, very prosperous. And then his clothes in the blood of grapes. Wait, I'm giving you the first level of symbolism and then I'm going to come back. So if some of you are thinking, but Margo, it means more than that. I know it does. We're going to come back and go second level next. Okay. So this is the first level, so it's surface level. And this would have been the surface level would have been what they got at the time. Because understand, these people have no idea who Jesus Christ is. We do. We can look back and go, oh, that meant so much more than what they thought. But let's go through what they would have received it as first. Okay. So if this, if this, if they're saying, if he's saying, Judah, you're, you're going to be so prosperous and so wealthy in your tribe that you're just going to wash your clothes in wine. In the blood of grapes, you'll be washing your own clothes. And your eyes are darker than wine. Now, some of them say, some some versions say that a little bit differently. But what it means is it's like you're up to your eyeballs in wine, basically. Which means you're so, you're overflowing with fruitfulness in your life. Like you got so much wine, you can't even, don't even know what to do with it. You don't even know what to do with it. And then your teeth whiter than milk. So another thing is you had so much milk. It's like your teeth are, are whiter than milk. I know that sounds weird to say, but it, that's what it meant for them. Okay. For us, we're like, what? Um, so that's the first level. So these men are sitting there. Judah's like, oh, <laughs> look at me. Look at me. I receive it, dad. I receive it. And they're thinking, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna rule. He's like, I'm going to be in charge and I'm going to be all wealthy. It's going to be so good. But there's another level to this they would have not understood, but he slid it in there when he brought up Shiloh. So what does this mean? He binds his donkey to the vine. His donkey's colt, so the baby donkey, to the choice vine. Are you seeing prophetic pictures in there with me about Jesus Christ? He rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, right? On a donkey's colt. Who is the choice vine? Who's the choice vine? That's another picture of Jesus. He is the vine and we are the branches. So Judah is being connected in here to the choice vine. Again, Judah's donkey's colt to the choice vine. To them at that time, it just meant he'd be wealthy. We understand it was a prophetic picture of Christ. Christ is the choice vine. Christ rides in on the donkey. Christ is um, Shiloh. Um, and then he washed his garments in wine. And his clothes in the blood of grapes. Why did the Lord see fit to say that twice? He said he washed his clothes in wine. And then he said it again in a different way. He said the blood of grapes. Why blood? I mean, it just kind of looks like blood. When you're crushing grapes, they would stand in the big vat and walk on them, crush the grapes. It kind of looks like you're like making them bleed, I guess. But this is a picture of Christ again. He was crushed. He was crushed. His blood is how we get set free, right? 
and if he's washing his garments in it, were his garments not washed in his own blood on the cross when he was being whipped and wounded and crushed for our iniquities? Were his garments not washed in blood? I believe too, and this could just be me, but I feel like the Holy Spirit is impressing this on me now. In verse 12, his eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. And I know for them, that was a saying at the time that made sense to them. It was like a colloquialism. But I also feel for me, it symbolizes his eyes being dark the sorrow, the grief, the pain that he endured and his teeth whiter than milk, meaning he was holy. No um, careless word ever came out of his mouth. He spoke life. He spoke blessings. He spoke truth. He was righteous. That's what I see in that. This is incredible, you guys. Thousands of years before the Messiah. Thousands and thousands of years before the Messiah. Jacob sees this. That through the line of Judah, the salvation of Israel would come. Okay, let's keep reading. I think we're going to get come back to this. The Holy Spirit, you show me where to go. Verse 13, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea and shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin Sidon. So this, they would be a tribe positioned close to the sea and do a lot of sea trade. So this is a very practical prophecy and blessing. Um. Verse 14, Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. So a burden for a donkey was the load. That's what you called the load the donkey was supposed to carry was their burden. This donkey's very strong and he has two burdens he's supposed to be carrying and he lies down in between them taking a break. Okay. He Verse 15, he saw that the rest was good and that The land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Mm. So he chilled out. These guys chilled out too much and rested and then became slaves because of it. Um, I mean, Jen P just put a comment. I want to stop him. She says, love diving into this. So amazing. The messianic prophecies all throughout the Bible. Because in the beginning, there was the word. That's right. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was slain before the foundations of the world. You guys, the lamb was slain. Oh, my goodness. Also, go read in the book of Revelation. How is he described? Talking about the blood, his clothes in the blood of grapes. You guys. The book of Revelation. He comes on the scene. And his robes are dripping in blood. Do you know that? His robes are dripping in blood. It is literally when we see him in his form, when he comes, his resurrected form, as described in the book of Revelation, we will see him wearing cloak dripping with blood. Just like this says. Oh, Lord have mercy. That is so cool. It is so cool. Um, okay, verse 16, Dan shall judge his people and be the tribes of Israel. Do you know that Dan means God is my judge? So his name was prophetic and he's continuing that prophetic judge sort of um, role here with Dan. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels and that its rider shall fall backward. 
I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. So they are, Dan is like um, um, shrewd in warfare is what that means. They're really cunning as far as, as far as warfare goes. And then 19, Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Number 20, bread from Asher shall be rich and he shall yield royal dainties. Meaning um, just rich, abundant food is what that means. They're going to be good producers of food. Um, 21, Nephtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Um, and they were, <clears throat> Nephtali was like mountain dwellers. They dwelled in the mountains. So like deer running around the mountains. Um, verse 22. Okay. Here's where we come to it again. And we're going to dive into this one. Oh, Lord have mercy. Holy spirit. I just am so amazed you guys at the Lord, the Bible. Okay. We're going to go into a blessing on Joseph. So while Israel did already bless Joseph's sons and kind of lift them up into the places where Reuben and Simeon should have been, according to man. He also is going to speak a blessing over Joseph. All right. Um, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over a wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. Listen, this is a picture of what has happened to him already. We know that he has undergone so much attack in his life, Joseph. And yet and still, he is like a branch planted by a well that is fruitful, constantly being watered and nourished and growing despite the fact that the he's been shot at and hated, but his bow remained in strength. See that the whole time, despite all the persecutions and trials and struggles, he remained strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, by the hands of the mighty God. of So he's giving God honor for what he's done in Joseph's life, that the blessing that has been upon Joseph has been by the hand of God himself. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. He's referring back again to the Messiah, saying that the Messiah comes from the mighty God of Jacob, um, not from Joseph himself. But we know that Joseph is an example of Christ in a lot of ways as well. So this is probably why he's brought up again in the blessing of Joseph, although Christ did not descend from Joseph. All right. Uh, physically, biologically. Verse 25, by the God of your father who will help you and by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings in the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, meaning he is going to have lots of descendants. Okay, lots of descendants, lots of kids. And we know that Ephraim as a tribe was huge. They had that, that blessing was trickled down to Ephraim for sure. Um, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Wow. So he just placed all of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and himself, J Jacob, upon Joseph. What, what does this mean? Because he's blessing all the boys in some way. This, this is referring, I believe, to the actual physical inheritance coming to Joseph instead of the rest. Um, Abraham was a rich, wealthy, prosperous man. Isaac followed in that with the hand of God on him to give him strategies for, for all of the things. And then Jacob as well. And he's saying like each generation has become more prosperous than the last um, in our family line. And you are going to continue that generational, generational blessing in your line. So your line is going to be even more prosperous than the ones pre previous. 
So he gets to reap that generational blessing, which is amazing. Um, so verse 27, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey. And at night, he shall divide the spoil. So he is. these people will be really good at hunting, is what that means. Um, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them and blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Now, Abraham purchased this field. Abraham. This is generations. At this point, hundreds of years. Remember, they lived a long time. Hundreds and hundreds of years. This cave was purchased in order to bury Sarah originally. And then they all started getting buried in it. So I want you to catch this. This is one of the things that I love the most about Jacob. And he is such a great example in his faith. They were great people of faith. So he's reminding Joseph. He's like, listen, well, he's reminding all of them, but I believe it was mostly to Joseph, but everybody's listening. So nobody could be arguing over what his final wishes were. Okay. Um, Hey, remember the cave? Remember the cave that Abraham bought? Remember that? Um, they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. They buried Isaac and Rebecca, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Verse 32, the cave, the field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his final his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Wow. That's the end. Now, let's unpack a couple little more things before we go. I know it's getting late. Um, it's just so much today. So much is packed into this. Um, so this is two, two points here. First of all, I want you to see that Leah is the one that is buried here with that's already been buried. So we know now she's already dead. The book of Genesis did not tell us that yet. It didn't tell us. We knew when Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Bethlehem, which is also a prophetic picture because her sons were Joseph and Benjamin, Joseph being an example of Christ and Benjamin being his name, being son of my right hand, which is a, um, sort of shadow of Christ as well on the way to Bethlehem, right? So that's very fascinating. Now, why didn't Rachel get buried in the cave with all the rest? Jacob wants to make sure he's going to get buried in there and he will be lying alongside Leah. Did you notice that Abraham and Sarah were together in there and Isaac and Rebecca were together in there? And it's not going to be Rachel together, even though we know Rachel is the one that Jacob loved. God favored Leah from the beginning. And, and the, the one who man favors is not always the one who God favors. And we see that lying that we see that playing out in this life of Jacob over and over in so many ways. Um, even even in himself, he was not the one that his dad favored, but God favored him. The same thing happened to Leah. Joseph, or Jacob didn't even want to marry her, right? He got tricked into it. And yet God, God was favoring her all along. He was favoring her all along. Who is the mother of Judah? Leah. Leah is the mother of Judah. Therefore, the grandmother of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, the ancestor of the lion of Judah. Jesus Christ. So God picked her to be in the lineage of Christ. Ooh, getting those chills again. He picks the ones. He picks. 
it's not always the ones we would pick. She wasn't very good looking, apparently. She had a, eye problems. She was the overlooked one that nobody wanted to marry. She was like getting past her time and her dad shoved her onto poor Jacob. But God said, this one's favored in my eyes. And she knew it when she had Judah. Oh, Lord have mercy. I have to go back. I have to go back. I have to go back and read it. It's all so prophetic, you guys. She named Judah praise. Do you remember this? Um, I don't know what chapter was it? I have to read it, you guys. The children. Okay. Okay. Verse 35 of chapter 29 is where she has Judah. And she says, it says, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. So somehow she knew that it was like a completion. Her other sons had been named terrible things like Reuben. His name, she called him that because the Lord looked on her affliction. And then she called, she said, because the next son, because I'm unloved, I'm going to name this son Simeon. So Reuben was named after her affliction of being unloved. Simeon was named because she felt unloved. Look at how prophetic these names became over these people. Okay. Over these babies. And then she had Levi and she said, surely he will become attached to me now because I have three sons. So even poor Levi, Levi was named out of her, her um, rejection. But once she just gave it up and decided to praise the Lord, she had Judah. And she said, you know what? I'm going to quit with all of this mourning and all of this being rejected and all of this nonsense. And I'm just going to now. It literally says, now I will praise the Lord. I'm just going to praise the Lord now with this fourth son, Judah. And look who Judah ends up becoming. And look who she ends up becoming as the ancestor of the Messiah. My goodness. There's so much a picture in that for us about praising God in the midst of our sufferings. Praising God in the midst of our sufferings. He finally decided to just praise the God, praise the Lord, named her son after that decision that she was making in her life. And then look what happened to him. If she could only have been alive to see that blessing come upon Judah, my goodness, she would have been so, so thrilled. But suffice to say, the Lord chose Leah. He favored her regardless of how Jacob treated her. It didn't matter. She was favored of God and she produced son after son after son. And she produced the literal tribe of Judah that would ultimately bring forth the Messiah. King David, all sorts of amazing people came out of that tribe. So praise God for that. He, he just, he sees things his own way, you guys. Um, so that's going to be it for today. Oh my goodness. I feel like there's so much more we could go into, but we just don't have time and let the Lord, let this just simmer and settle. Oh, I just realized I missed another comment from Hayes. What did he say? He redeemed Tamar's line after her, after his sons died. Wait, who's Tamar? Oh, it must have been more in the line. Was it in in Reuben's line? I think he was talking about that was that was a while ago. I should have just skimmed over it. 
anyways. So with that, I just pray for you today as we close out that you were blessed and encouraged and um, realize how miraculous our God is and our Messiah is. And that he was there since the beginning. He's been slain before the foundations of the world. It was all there. And we as people have just been sort of living it out throughout history. God's incredible plan is incredible plan that was put into motion before everything. Um, it's amazing. It's incredible. Um, I bless you. And I will be back on Thursday morning with our final session of the life of Jake. Okay. Love you guys. See you Thursday.